Before I came in here a while ago, uh, I got some coffee. Well, that was this morning. That was an earlier time yesterday, I think. I did drink some coffee today, but <laughs> yesterday I, dil I diluted it, though. I diluted it for a purpose. I didn't have time to drink a lot of hot coffee, so I put some cool water in it. I diluted it. That way I got the coffee, but I didn't have to drink it real quickly. So I diluted that coffee. I made it weaker. And sometimes we do dilute things. We dilute paint. We put paint thinner in it. And uh, we dilute other things. We may get some drinks in the store, non-alcoholic, of course, and dilute it with water or something to make it go farther. But when it comes to the truth, we can't dilute the truth and get away with it. Friends, if we seek to dilute the truth, then we won't be the Lord's church. And you know how we know that? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 speaks of the house of God, the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of the truth, the unadulterated, undiluted truth of God. If it is diluted truth that man is standing on, that's not the Lord's church. And we have a lot of congregations today that are no longer holding fast the form of sound words that we are commanded in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verse number 13. Moreover, we know that, and this has been said earlier, no doubt, but the Lord is of the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And also, I want to say it's been a great blessing and a privilege to hear these faithful brethren get up here having their loins girt about with truth, Ephesians 6, 14, and taking the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the only kind of preacher that God is going to be pleased with, and the only kind of eldership, and the only kind of congregation is one that will stand on God's pure and holy truth. We know that Jesus said, To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. John 18, 37. So my friend today, if you are of the truth, then you are in fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, John 16, 13, and the Father and the Son who are of the truth. In 1 John 4, verse 6, the Apostle John wrote, We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us, that is, us the apostles. Hereby know we the Spirit of Truth and the Spirit of Error. And one thing that will test our theme today is this. Can one know God by keeping commandments that are admixed with human commandments? Think about that. John said in 1 John 2, 3, And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. His, God's commandments, does not include the commandments of men. We can only know the Lord by keeping his commandments. So to add to the Lord's commandments means that one does not know God. To follow those commandments that are diluted with men's opinions and men's commandments means that one does not know God. Another thing to consider is 1 Timothy 2, 4, where we have considered before that God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, the definite article, the, the truth. That means that God has a certain set standard of truth, and it cannot be added to or taken away from without eternal consequences. The truth, it is absolute, it is unchanging, it is eternal in nature. 
Now, there was an amazing story that came out in 2005 about a cancer patient named Georgia Hayes. It said that she won a $2.2 billion court settlement against her pharmacist who had diluted her chemotherapy drugs with water. In the process, she had lost her best chance for recovery, as it was stated here on the internet by one preacher, but yet her life was shortened. Her chemotherapy was diluted. To dilute means to make thinner, to lessen strength, to adulterate, to reduce, reduce the value or efficiency of, to make, fa to make fainter or to water down. That's what we mean by diluting. Now, of course, we have the warning in the Bible not to add to or take away from God's Word, Revelation 22, 18, 19. But also, there's another aspect of this, and that is there are some that want to water down and weaken the truth. Can you imagine how some people would have changed Peter's Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, where Peter accused the Jewish multitude of killing the Lord and the Christ? They would say, oh, that's, that's just too hard. You don't want to say that. And what did Stephen say to the Jews in Acts 7? Ye stiff not, necked in heart and ears. Stiff-necked. These brethren were plain, and this is how they pricked the hearts, as one of the brethren mentioned earlier. We have to make it plain. As Brother Brown said, like hitting the donkey or the mule uh, with a hammer or a board or whatever he hit him with, got his attention. Got, anyway, got the mule's attention anyway. Friends, we have to do that in preaching. We have so many preachers now that just want to make everybody feel good. You know, if you go away feeling bad about your life, although you're living in sin, well, that, that, that church doesn't fit me. That's not my kind of preacher. One that can speak and does smooth things. Isaiah warned against Isaiah 30.10. That's the kind of preacher I want. That's the kind of congregation I want. One to make me feel good. I can do what I want to. You know, Paul warned about that after charging Timothy to preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, Second Timothy 4 2. He said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. For after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Second Timothy 4, verse 3 and 4. Now tell me, friends, have we reached that state in the brotherhood today? Yes, we have. Many places, in fact, most places, many brethren will no longer endure sound doctrine. You can ask some of us preachers here how long you can stay in some of these places if you preach sound doctrine. Maybe a year or two or three, if that long. And they'll start making plans for you after one of those moving sermons that we talked about earlier, one of the brethren during this lectureship. They do not want the pure doctrine of Christ. But here's what Peter said, pure and unadulterated to the Jews. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts 2 verse 36. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We have to preach to prick hearts. We're not up here to try to hurt people's feelings or to be unnecessarily harsh. But yet, if we just preach the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15, we're still going to prick hearts. Peter was preaching the truth in love on Pentecost Day. Do we not know that? 
Stephen in Acts chapter 7, although what he said was hard and strong, he was preaching the truth in love. Preaching the truth in love, friends, doesn't mean that we just get up and we are very just so mild in what we say that we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's not what preaching the truth in love is. We preach the truth and love for God first and love for those souls that we're speaking to. You know that preaching the strong truth, convicting people of their sins, shows greater love than getting up and making people feel good and letting them go on their merry way to eternal destruction. That's not love. When we don't tell people the truth, that's not love. Or when we hold back and we do not tell them the whole truth, that's not love. Love is when we care enough about them to tell them what they need to hear. What did Paul say to the Galatians? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4, 16. What did the wise man say in Proverbs 27? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, Jesus exemplified that to Peter, didn't he, in Matthew 16? When he said in verse 23, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, Peter was not trying to be a tool of Satan, but the effect of what he was saying, if it had been accomplished, would have accomplished Satan's purpose. Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. My friends, as we think today about our lesson, I'd like to go to Matthew 23, verse 27 and 28. Here the Lord pronounced several woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. He called them hypocrites. But do you think the Lord did not love them? Yes, he loved them. But it reached the point in their hearts they needed this in order to wake them up. And Jude talked about pulling some out of the fire there in the book of Jude. There reaches a point with some people that you have to be so direct or you're not going to rescue their souls. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 23, 27, 28, Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Now, there's a word that Jesus used there that relates to the next passage we want to go to. He spoke to them being whited sepulchers. That's like whitewashed sepulchers. If you go over to the book of Ezekiel, the 13th chapter, there were those who daubed the walls in such a way to make it look like the walls were sound and strong, but they weren't. Now, you can whitewash a fence, or you can whitewash something and make it look good, but it's not thoroughly painted or fortified. Think about those false prophets that Ezekiel spoke of in Ezekiel chapter 13. They wanted everything to look good, to make it look good. But look at the analogy that the prophet Ezekiel uses. Ezekiel 13, verse number 10. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Untempered mortar. They used something that was diluted, not the real thing that it needed. Look at verse 15 also. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. Now think about this wall for a moment. These prophets had used whited plaster used to patch up a wall so as to give the appearance without the reality of strength and beauty. The false prophets did not go up to the gaps or make up the breaches and the cracks in the wall, according to verse number 5. 
as good architects do with mortar. They used untempered mortar. And I ask you today, friends, as we look at the brotherhood, do we not have a lot of church leaders and preachers doing the same thing? They're trying to give an appearance of soundness and take certain things they might stand against without standing against all sin, without standing against all false doctrine, and not taking corrective measures to make things right. Do not we see that today in the Lord's church and the brotherhood using untempered mortar, as it were, to give a good appearance, but the reality of soundness and strength in opposition to evil is simply not there. On the highland of Haiti in 2010, there was a terrible earthquake. More than 500,000 Haitians, it was said, were killed. And it was said that one of the reasons or causes was untempered mortar. Greedy contractors skimped on the percent of concrete they mixed into the mortar and expensive iron rebar. That's what they did. They diluted it, didn't they? They diluted that which should have gone on to these buildings. In diluting it, they made it weak. They daubed it, as it were, with untempered pitch. Princeton WordNet says of diluted, it means to load, to adulterate, to stretch, dilute, to debase, to corrupt, or make impure by adding a foreign or inferior substance, often by replacing valuable ingredients with inferior ones. Now let's think about the ingredients of God's word, the truth, the ingredients of the gospel. They are so precious and valuable that to adulterate them or dilute them with man's words and opinions is the evil of the highest kind. No one's thoughts or words can compare with God's because his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts and our thoughts even as the high heavens are higher than the earth, according to Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. When Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also the Greek, Romans 1, 16, he's talking about the pure gospel, not something that's been adulterated or diluted with man's teaching or man's words or that has been weakened down. Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11, not as the oracles of God and men, but the oracles of God, God's word, not man's. I want us to think about another scripture in the Old Testament, Psalm 119, verse 160. The American Standard Version says, the sum, S-U-M, the sum of thy word is truth. Now, the things that make up the truth must be all the truth. It can't have man's words and commandments admixed into it. If any of the parts are changed, the sum is no longer the truth. It cannot equal the truth if it is not totally God's word in every part. The truth on any Bible topic amounts to all that the Bible, God's word, teaches on that topic. Let's illustrate that for a moment. What about baptism? We have uh, some of our denominational neighbors. They immerse baptismal candidates in water. They take them down into the water, they're buried in the water, and brought up out of the water. The physical form and action of the baptism is correct. But yet the motive and the reason is not. So yes, we must of necessity immerse and bury people in the water and bring them up out of the water. For we are buried with Christ in baptism according to Colossians 2, 4 and Romans 6, 4. When Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, he took him down into the water and baptized him. And they came up out of the water. That's what baptism is. But yet in denominationalism, we do not have the right purpose for baptism. There are some who are baptized to show that they've already been saved. As some would say, 
before their baptism, God, for Christ's sake, has pardoned my sins. Or I'm being baptized as an outward sign of inward renewal. Or I'm being baptized to show that I'm already forgiven and saved from my sins. That's not New Testament baptism. Not only must the mode, a burial in water, be correct, but the purpose of baptism must be according to the Scriptures. For the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. To have one's sins washed away, Acts 22.16, by the blood of Christ, no less, Revelation 1.5. And to be saved, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16.16. 16. One must be baptized in order to be saved, to be forgiven, to be cleansed by the blood of Christ, and to get into Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We must be baptized into the body of Christ, the church. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So yes, the command to be buried in water, I said it was physical, but it also was spiritual because we have to follow God's plan and what he said to do. Just as when God, through the prophet, told Naaman the leper to go dip in Jordan seven times before he would be cleansed of his leprosy. And when he did that, when he finally decided to do it, he was cleansed. In like manner, those who are lost in sin are not in any position to argue with God. They are lost in sin. God is the Savior. We don't have any right to argue with God. If we're lost, we better do what God says do. We must obey the Lord. He said, And why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? But if any component has been changed, been added to or removed from the gospel plan of salvation, whatever aspect of it it might be, it's no longer the truth. For example, there are some who teach sprinkling. They substitute sprinkling water for a burial in water. Or they will change the motives of baptism. But now here is another example of diluting the truth. This is in the qualifications of elders. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, Titus 1, 5 to 9, we have the God-inspired qualifications for elders laid out. But back in 1990 at Brown Trail, there was another qualification added as Dave Miller was the speaker. And they said he must be a man whom the congregation will follow if he is to remain an elder or if he is to be put in as an elder. Now where in the New Testament do we find that? Some members might not follow a man because their heart's not right with God. And moreover, we don't just follow one man in the eldership. We follow the eldership, the elders, plural, not just one. And so all of these things are adding to and diluting the truth. God did not give that qualification. And moreover, to add voting on the eldership, to remove a scripturally qualified elder is unscriptural. Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. We are to obey. God instituted elders, that is those who've been put in the eldership according to God's word. So to add a qualification to the eldership is unscriptural. And here's another thing that some brethren are doing to dilute the truth. And this is regarding Christian church baptism. They say we can add denominational baptism. They, don't, they won't say it like that, but that's what they're doing. We can have someone in the Christian church who has been baptized for the remission of sins, and all they have to do to become a faithful member of the Lord's church and recognize their error is to repent like a person being restored back to the faith who has once obeyed the gospel. Phil Sanders is one who teaches that. That can be documented in the Christian Chronicle, I believe it was the February issue of 2006, to accept people who've been baptized at the Christian church baptism. 
So how can you accept one in the Lord's church who was baptized not even thinking he was being baptized in the Lord's church, but into a denomination? Some people have the idea that remission of sins is the only prerequisite for baptism or thing that must be understood. Yes, remission of sins is a purpose. Acts 2.38. But let's go over to the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, verse number 12. And here we will see that the Samaritans were taught more than just remission of sins prior to their baptism. Of course, they had to believe on Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We know that from Acts 8, 35 to 39, when Philip baptized the eunuch and consequently made that confession before he was baptized. But look at Acts 8, verse number 12. But when they, that is the Samaritans, believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. These Samaritans were taught concerning the church of the Lord, the kingdom of God. Beloved, that's not the Christian church or any other denomination. That's the Lord's church that we read about in the New Testament. So how can people be taught wrong and baptized right? Well, they cannot. And we cannot accept people who have been taught incorrectly prior to their baptism. They must be taught again and baptized according to the New Testament. These Samaritans, before their baptism, were taught concerning the kingdom of God, the church of Christ. They were also taught concerning the name of Jesus Christ, according to Acts 8, 12. The name of Jesus Christ, certainly that would include his deity, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. But it would also involve his authority, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. And that all that we are to do is to be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3.17. Just like that board up there says. So plain in front of us. In the name of the Lord Jesus. When we do something in the name of the Lord Jesus, that doesn't mean we go around raising our hands. I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. It means that we act, we live, we teach, we preach, we obey according to the Lord's word. The New Testament. Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Does the Christian church do that? What about their worship? They don't regard the name of Jesus Christ in their worship. They have added mechanical instruments of music to the worship. There's another delusion of the truth or deluding the truth. So people baptized in the Christian church... They don't understand and know the things that the Samaritans knew before their baptism in Acts chapter 8. So how can we accept this? You know this teaching has been put into the spiritual sword by way of Phil Sanders some years ago. There are some brethren that actually believe that. You can accept the person in the church if the, although they were baptized in a denomination. You can accept them without baptizing them correctly if simply they were baptized for the remission of sins. There are some denominations that do baptize for remission of sins, but they add mix what they teach with error and human doctrine. Thus, it is not the truth that people are taught and believe when they're baptized in these denominations. Now, I mentioned instrumental music and worship. Now, we talked about God's law of exclusion the other night. When the Lord said, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, make a melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19, that excludes all other kind of music in the church because there's no other kind of music in the church authorized. Instrumental music is not authorized by God. That's why it's excluded right there. But why that singing is included. But now, my friends... Let's look at a few other examples before we close. The Mac Deaver doctrine on the new birth dilutes the truth. Because Brother Deaver has added an aspect to the one baptism, Ephesians 4 5, that the New Testament does not have. He has said that in order 
To be what God wants us to be, we must be baptized in the water and undergo Holy Spirit baptism. And he distorts John 3, 5 to teach that. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Thus talking about the new birth, the one baptism of Ephesians 4, 5. When one submits to the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, and is born again of incorruptible seed, being baptized into Christ, he is born again. He is regenerated. By the washing of regeneration, Titus 3 and verse Number five. But now let's look at a few more examples before we close shortly. A diluted or watered down gospel. Back in the book of Isaiah, before the gospel was given in Acts 2, we find the prophet of God, Isaiah, Isaiah 58, 1. Spare not, spare not, show my people their transgression. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Spare not. Don't, do not hold back. That's what a lot of congregations and preachers are doing. They're holding back. Show my people their transgressions. Make it so plain they can't miss it. Be so specific they understand what their sins are. And why they are in sin and why they need to repent. And we're not just talking about people that aren't in the church. We're talking about people that are in the Lord's church. That have sins going on in their lives. For example, in some pulpits today, they are virtually silent regarding drinking, social drinking. Of course, as one brother said, when you take one drink, you're one drink drunk. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20, verse 1. What about mixed women and immodest apparel? How many sermons do you hear about that anymore? You know, you still you hear a lot of preaching about that. About modesty. About women wearing short skirts and halter tops and things like that. And men, too, that dress immodestly. There's a lot of that among men. Now, I don't mean necessarily wearing short skirts, but you, so, there are some men doing that today, by the way. But nevertheless, how much preaching do we hear on that? Oh, I, you know, he's a 1950s preacher. You know, let's just forget about that. Friends, that's the Bible. Talked to a lady, young lady here recently that used to attend where I preached. And... Uh, Years went on, she married this man, and they had some children. I think two of them were by her and her husband. And, she, you know, she's real friendly and nice, but I asked her, I said, you know, when are you coming back to the Church of Christ? She's going to the denomination. She said, well, I, th I think growing up in the Church of Christ is going to mess my marriage up. I, I gathered from that her marriage was a question about the scripturality of her marriage. I said, but that doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Matthew 19, 9. What about dancing? What about dancing? How much do we hear about that? You know, that's one of the most lustfully provocative things that a boy, a girl, a man, or woman can do. No two normal male and female together can dance without triggering something very sinful in their hearts that will follow them into the bed of fornication, or they will follow it into the bed of fornication. You know, we need to preach like the Hebrews writer did. One time in a place where I preached, there was a couple living together, and I sat down and talked to them. And they wanted me to marry them. Well, that was fine. They knew the one of them ever been married. I said, but before I do, you're going to have to separate and not live together. And I simply quoted Hebrews 13, 4 from the King James Version, which says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. 
Well, guess what? The girl went home and told her mother that I caught her. Friends, the Bible calls it whoredom. That's what it is. Fornication, adultery, whoredom. Have we soft soaped the gospel? You know, soft soap in the pulpit won't cleanse the sinner in the pew. There are many that want to water down the truth. And, of course, there are some that are virtually silent about the Masonic Lodge or about gambling and playing the lottery. And, oh, you know what, just a little lottery ticket, what's the harm in that? Well, what's the difference in stealing a pencil and a million dollars? In principle, it's the same thing. It's wrong. All stealing is wrong. All lust is wrong. All fornication is wrong. But before we close, I, I do want to give this example of diluting the truth. And that's in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 1. Verse 5. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first Day, that's plain. Evening and morning, that's from the Hebrew word yom, meaning a 24-hour period. And also, in Exodus 20, verse number 11. And by the way, Moses wrote that in Genesis 2. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, by inspiration of God. Now, I'm, where I'm going with this is to oppose theistic evolution. Because there are some, and even in the brotherhood, that teach theistic evolution and believe it. They are seeking to dilute God's truth on the creation that God made in the beginning. So they figure, well, we can still believe in God, but harmonize creation with evolution. Saying, well, God used the evolutionary process to bring about creation. Well, is that okay? No, it's not, because that's a lie. It's not the truth. Moses declared in Exodus 20, verse 11. I mean, Genesis 1 is plain enough. But listen to what he said in connection with the Sabbath day in Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He, he likens the, the six-day Hebrew work week until the six days of creation and the seventh day of creation when God rested to the Sabbath day that they were to follow under the old law. That's very plain. Now, this gets even more serious. Do you know that to dilute the truth regarding the creation account is to deny the deity of Jesus Christ? It is. Let's go to Mark 12, verse number 25, before we close shortly. In Mark 12, verse 25, Jesus speaking to the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. Excuse me, verse 26. Jesus said, And as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Here and several other places in the New Testament, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ held up the authenticity and the inspiration of Moses. Now, if Moses was wrong about the creation being in six 24-hour periods, if he was wrong about that, either the Lord knew that he was wrong and still authenticated him, or the Lord did not know it and therefore is not omniscient and all-knowing. But neither one is the case. Moses was right. He was inspired of God. And the Lord is divine. But if he's not all-knowing, he can't be divine. But he does know everything. And we can believe the truth, every bit of it, friends, and we're not to add one particle to it or take one particle away from it, lest the curses of God rest upon us. This afternoon we may have someone here who needs to come and obey the gospel. Maybe you have believed a deluded gospel. 
Maybe you have allowed a false teacher, even within the church, to lead you astray. My friend, if you need to obey the gospel, you must hear and believe the word of God, Romans 10, 17. You must repent or perish, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. You must confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, before men, or he will deny you before the Father, Acts 8, 37, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And you must be baptized to be saved. You cannot be saved without baptism. That's not my word. That's not the word of any of these men here who preached. That's the word of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Or if we should have any here who need to return to the Lord. You know, the end is worse than the beginning for that person who has once known the truth and turned from it, according to 2 Peter 2. 20 to 22. If you need to return or come to the Lord today, would you not come while we stand and we sing together?